As they're heading out, I just wanted to kind of pick up on one of the things that Pastor Jay had kind of pointed out, and that was the YouVersion app. If you have a smartphone or a tablet or even a computer, uh, YouVersion or Bible.org, if you go on to uh, a computer, I think it's Bible.org or Bible.com. It's one of the two, sorry. Um, you will find an app that lets you download Bibles uh, for free, has reading plans, and if you're right down here in the very bottom, we showed this a couple weeks ago, right down the very bottom, you'll find a little box, whether it's Android or an iPhone. You'll find a little box down there. You click that box, and it opens up, and it has a list there. And one of the lists, it says, Events Near Me. And if you click that, even now, you'll find this event, this Sunday morning service. Uh, there's, all the, there's actually extra questions on there. There's places to take notes. All the sermon scriptures are on there. Uh, you can look at that afterward. You can take notes during church. So if somebody's playing on their phone next to you and it sounds like a video game, they're really just, really, they're doing the YouVersion app. Uh, so uh, we want you to try to see if this works for you, uh, see if it connects with you. Uh, we want to try to use this in this next series on um, Not a Fan. And so we're trying to get us kind of geared up for that. We are wrapping up our series today on the question why. And if you... Uh, have been with us over the last eight weeks. We've gone through three major prayers in the book of Ephesians, and then we've gone through now uh, four weeks of um, these, this series on why. What's God telling us? What's our purpose in life? And today we're going to wrap that up. And as we've been trying to really nail down the question, where do you find your purpose? And that's kind of been the big question that we've been asking over and over again. And uh, my wonderful wife uh, came to me this, uh, this week and actually asked me the question, I didn't really understand how your sermon fit last week. So she did it really graciously and it was really helpful. So I just want to make sure that you understand what we're trying to get to with this whole, this whole point of this sermon series is, is, is why do you do anything? And, and, and today you could just ask the question, why do you love your spouse? Why do you work hard? Why are you respectful to police or government officials? Why? Why do you honor your teachers or coaches? What's the motivation behind that? Is it just you don't want to get in trouble? You don't want pain in your life? So, yeah, I'm going to try to cut the corner so I just stay out of trouble. Or is there something much deeper in our lives that we can build our lives on that builds real passion, and even for this series of sermon, more importantly, real purpose in life? Why are you here? Why do you exist is really the depth of this question. We started off weeks ago with this passage of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God of our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. So in other words, this took place before creation, that we should be, and we've said this, these, these two words a lot of times, holy and blameless before him. That's the whole point. The whole point of you're saying, okay, what's this series about? How do I live that out? How do I live out holy and blameless in my life? And it begins to realize, and we begin to realize that God's calling us up to something greater, something higher, not mediocrity, not just getting by, not just kind of staying out of trouble, but he is calling us to greatness in our life. The first couple of weeks, we started talking about how to begin that process, and, and the process began with being a recipient of God's love, learning to accept God's love. I was created to receive His love more than anything else. The first step in all of that was to receive God's love, and we described it, in the, in the book of Ephesians described it, that we were His workmanship. That we were created by God and we are His workmanship. He is crafting us and molding us and shaping us for His purpose, to be holy and blameless. And so that a lot of what we're talking about is not even what I do, but it's what He's doing in me or what He's doing in you. And then we wanted to look at our lives from that perspective. We were to take selfies and go, God's working in me. There's beauty here that maybe I've never seen before. 
Maybe I need to get rid of some of the guilt and some of the shame and some of the whatever and live in this kind of newness of life. (coughs) Then the next week we went on to talk about how this holy blameless works out together. That this is not just an I thing, and and we're going to deal with this even more today, that by nature in our society, we think individually. We live individual lives, separate, for the most part, from other people. This impacts the way we live, the way we think, the way we embrace Scripture, and the way we deal with holy and blameless. We view it primarily as what I am doing on my own. But that's not the way God viewed it. We are reconciled to one another, the Bible said, as we are reconciled together with Him. So as I'm growing together with Him, I'm going to grow together with you. No matter what our backgrounds or where we came from or what kind of lifestyle we've had before, none of that really matters because God's bringing all things together under Him. So much of our purpose in life is to be lived out in community. Part of that phrase that we grabbed that day was, he came to kill hostility, to break down anger and separation and isolation. He came to kill that and to destroy that. And that's really going to impact us in our sermon today. And then last week, real quickly, we we went to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 24. And here's what we read last week. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, which is corrupt through deceitful desires. To be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And we turned in this passage to what we're supposed to do, our responsibility, to say no to some things, to take off the old man. There was a long list. We went through a bunch of things, but you just name it, it was in the list. (coughs) Excuse me. Of things that we're supposed to put off. Say no to. And then when we do that, there's this renewing that that the Spirit does, empowering us to see life the right way, allowing us to put on the new man, to put on new things in our life, the things that God wants us to put on. That ultimately led us to this passage that I love in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. For me, it's one of the most impactful passages in this entire series. That my role in holy and blameless, and what does this look like? (coughs) I'm going to need something to drink. What am I supposed to look like? I'm imitating God. I'm not becoming God, but I'm supposed to take on the character that He has designed for me, that He has designed for you. That's what we're supposed to embrace. You talk about a high calling, way beyond mediocrity, way beyond just surviving. God wants us to live out a victorious life looking like Him, like He designed us to look. That's what God's designed for you. That's the calling that God has for you. And if that automatically begins to put some condemnation, once again, I'd take you back to that first sermon where I'm a recipient of God's great love. So don't let that shame, don't let guilt come over you and go, oh, you know, I'm never going to arrive at that. Yes, you are. That's God's plan for you. Today, we want to talk about one more piece of how that actually works out. So we're going to be looking towards the very end of the book of Ephesians today on how holy and blameless work out. I want to, just from the very beginning, let you know that this sermon is going to be challenging to you. And it doesn't matter where you are in life And what role you play, this sermon goes to the very depth of human relationship and interaction. In fact, this sermon is so completely countercultural that if you're not careful, as soon as you hear it, you're going to go, oh, he, that's wrong. <laughs> that's so wrong. I want you to fight that initial feeling for just a few moments and ask yourself this simple question. Is there really any way to live out God's greatness if we live according to the culture around us? Because the culture around us denies the very existence of God. So it's not really logical that their culture and the society around us is going to be pushing us in a direction that honors what God honors and the way God sees things. So of course, what we're going to say is going to be countercultural. It's going to be difficult. 
I would like for you to begin by just answering this simple question and begin to think about this. What is your view of authority? It's probably been a long time since you were asked that. Maybe you've never been asked that question. How do you view authority? What are the positions that you're presently in where you are in authority? Begin to think about those. What roles do you play where you actually have some authority over other individuals? Raises the question, should you? Should there be any of this stuff in our society? And we like to begin to think, how has our society actually shaped our view of authority? Once again, we're very strongly individualistic. Autonomy is kind of our main value. Go to other places in the world and it's radically different, right? People don't think like we do. And I'm not saying it's all bad, but we at least have to consider our society and what it's teaching us and what we're grabbing a hold of. Another question. Are you comfortable laughing at or ridiculing your prime minister, your teachers, your civic leaders, your coaches, or your parents? Just think about it for a moment. How do you feel about each of those people? I've got a little thing up here. There's a whole kind of genre in our society called political cartoons. And I didn't actually put them up there because uh, I, I just grabbed some. And, and uh, we're so good at this. Not, not only do we laugh at our own politicians, we have a whole culture in our society that laughs at the nation south of us. And you may think, well, there's lots to laugh at. That's okay. Um, but what does that actually teach us day after day after day? When we're told to laugh at the most powerful people in our society, I want to ask you, do you believe there were political cartoons in the days of Julius Caesar? Stalin? No. So what is this teaching us over and over and over again about the question of authority? And then the next question that kind of came to my mind is, does this matter to God? Does God actually care about whether we do political cartoons or not? And maybe that's not that big a deal, but maybe the thought behind it is a pretty big deal to God. Does God care about this? And is it important to the great living that God is asking us to do? Does it impact that? We're going to step out of Ephesians to another part of Rome, uh, another part of Paul's uh, letters just for a moment just to kind of get a verse of scripture that I think really fits in here and gives us a little idea of what Paul thinks in, in the book of Romans. Here we go. Romans chapter 13 verse 1 and 2. Let every person be subject, submit to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, let's admit that that's a countercultural statement. That's not how we normally view our governing officials. And I would remind you that the ones that Paul is writing about here uh, were not notoriously good necessarily. So from the very beginning, we want to just grab a hold of what God is saying, that all real human authority, all real human authority, all real authority actually proceeds from God. It comes from Him. Now, I'm not going to have time today to go into the, the, the cases in which we have to deal with abusive authority. What do I do when the authority becomes really abusive. We don't have time for that, and I, I would love to have that discussion with you because I think the Bible addresses that. What we want to do today is deal with the big principle of authority and at least where we can deal with it in our lives. So what we tend to do is want to look at those minute cases so I don't have to deal with the big picture of authority. Where does the government have the right to have authority and issue decrees and laws, and, and should I submit those myself to those? I think Paul begins to 
give us some information. Last week we ended up in the book of Ephesians at the end of chapter 8. And the last passage we read was actually chapter 5, verse 18. Uh, and then verse 21. Here we go. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, being continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the, the next verses that follow down on to verse 21 kind of give us some other things to do and worship and things like that. And at the end it says this, in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that leads us into the following passage. So there's a connection. Matter of fact, there's a verbal connection between being filled with the Spirit and connecting with Christ. You can't actually separate the two. In other words, what Paul's trying to say, being filled with the Spirit is all these things. It's worshiping and singing songs with one another and connecting and submitting to one another. The reality of this passage that Paul is trying to teach within the church, but also within society in, great, in, in a greater way as well, is that one another here means that each and every human being is responsible to submit to someone. I want you to grasp your, you know, think of that through. Every human being in this room has someone they're supposed to submit to. So I want you to now think about your list. Who's on your list? Who are you supposed to submit to? And how do you feel about submitting to those individuals? Do you automatically have this kind of, I don't really like that. It's not really very comfortable for me. See, the Bible says that we're placed under, that's what submission means, placed under the authority of someone else, and in a biblical term, who's acting under the authority of God. And if you want to think about how I ever respond differently than submission, is, is it, are they under the authority of God still? And that's what Paul's dealing with in the, in the following sections. How do we deal with those that we're supposed to follow, we're supposed to submit to? We're going to deal with these. And Paul begins what's called the family codes. These were common in Greek world where all kind of philosophers used family codes. It's how do we act in the family. I think that's an interesting thing that that used to actually be kind of in vogue. This is the way families should act. The Greeks did it. Paul's taking that and, and making it a part of the, the epistles, not just here but in other places, so we know how to live holy and blameless. So I actually thought I would look to see if I could find some. So, of course, in our world, that's not as common. So I went to one of my websites. I go every once in a while just to see how people are responding to things, Quora. And I asked the question, why should kids obey their parents? Why should kids obey their parents? And I, uh, we're going to flip the screen up there. And to be honest with you, it was staggering. Uh, the first one I found was this. They shouldn't. This is why, as a parent, I only protect my child from harm. Then I just get out of the child's way and let the child explore things. The next one. The word submission, obey, implies... I'm sorry, the, the word obey implies submission. It also implies, in the context of the question, that parents are infallible and ever righteous entities. If this were true, our society would not express, experience progress. Only youngsters are bold enough to break the rules and propel innovation. The next one. If in my child's judgment, parental obedience doesn't seem like a good idea, I want my children to explain to me why they don't want to do that. In this way, communication is open for discussion as to why I'm asking my child to do that thing. I have raised my children to question me, and most importantly, to think for themselves. I want you to know when I read this, I was actually stunned. Um, I read the whole page. There was only one person who said, yes, children should obey their parents. Interestingly, they didn't have children. Um, and here's where I want to, once again, if you read the whole, I, I've, I've picked out the little piece, if you read the whole context, you kind of get what the parents are trying to do. They're trying to not be the belligerent parent. That's deeply what's in most of these. They're trying not to be the belligerent parent. But I ask you the question, about uh, uh, the, the question of submission, the very guy that wrote the second one, for him, submission was such a horrible word that he couldn't even think about a child having to submit and be obedient. 
Today, we actually want to ask this question of what does this look like in relationships, both sides of it, the leader and the, the one submitting, in all three areas that Paul has looked at. And ask the question, what is going on in each of these? I want you to hang with me and don't give up on me before you get to the end and go, I don't like this at all. Because you need to ask the question, how do human relationships actually work? <laughs> how are they supposed to work where there's not hostility? See, that's remember going back to what? That Christ came to break the hostility. And is that what he's trying to do in the way he defines relationships here? Is that we're here to break down hostility. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, the first one is on husbands and wives. At the very end of that, after he's given all the, the verses, here's what he says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Wouldn't that be a great way to live? Or do we really want to live in hostility, doing this, banging against one another? Which way seems right? Well, in the autonomous mind, it's only one way right. Ephesians chapter 5, let's look at everything that Paul says leading up to this. Once again, counterculture, here we go. Wives, submit to your own husbands, that's to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, and he is Christ, the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And I know, if you're sitting there and you're going, there's not a chance. I understand that this sounds completely bizarre in our modern world. I remind you that in our modern world, marriages are breaking down at a pace that is staggering. So before we throw it out, let's at least ask the question, is there anything here that we should be holding on to? Over and over again, this is what this passage actually screams out. This passage actually screams out the oneness of marriage. There's one head and one body. These are working together. They're not two isolated individuals with one of them telling the other one what to do or two autonomous people trying to live together but actually be on their own because that's kind of the world's view, the kind of two extremes. The ideal, the ideal of marriage is where a man and a woman are living together as one and rooting out the competition for the control of leadership. This is designed to kill the hostility in relationships that build up naturally by either having leaderless relationships or a constant power struggle in the relationship. That's what Christ is trying to do. I realize this is difficult. I realize that often we step back and we go, God, I blew that. I didn't do that the way I'm supposed to. But at least let's look at what we're supposed to be achieving so that we can end the hostilities and live life the way God wants us to live. I had a really awkward thought this week as I was preparing the sermon. Matter of fact, it's one of the first things that came to me about this sermon. I thought, what would it look like on Judgment Day when I stand before Christ that instead of Christ being there, he said, hey, Lori, you come on up and you judge him. You judge the way he loved you and the way he dealt with you. And I begin to think, man, that might be kind of complicated. Because she knows me best. <laughs> she knows me at my worst. You guys know me a little bit. She knows me in ways that you don't. Paul doesn't leave us here. We're going to come back to the male side and, and, the, and, and the, the husband side. But we're going to get all three of them together. And I want to do it this way for a reason, because I want it to help us. Paul gives us two more examples. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is, what does it say? Right. It is right countercultural apparently that is countercultural I actually didn't expect it I actually still believe that most people believe that children should learn to be obedient that this was a good thing honor your father and mother this is the first commandment with promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land in other words there's kind of this promise and curse thing look if children are completely disobedient 
Instead of having this wonderful evolving culture, we're going to have chaos. Teenagers that are here with us, do not contribute to the collapse of society around you by disobedience. Learning to say yes to parents, I want you to listen, learning to say yes to parents is the first step to self-discipline. As I learned to say yes to mommy and daddy as a little bitty kid, yes, 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 yes. As I grow up, I learn to say yes, and it gets harder because my will gets established. And I begin to go, I don't like what they want. I want something different. But when I learn to say yes to that, I'm actually learning to say yes to God. And equally, I'm learning to say yes to myself. If you are a person that is struggling with self-discipline, no matter your age, I would encourage you to ask this very simple question. Did you ever learn to say yes to your parents? Or was that a constant this? Was there constant hostility where you looked at your parents and said, I'm not doing it. I'm going to do what I want to do. And now you look 20 years later and you can't do what you want to do. You always do the worst thing. You always cave in and you're sitting there going, I don't want to do this, but you cave in anyway. I'm not saying that's the only reason we struggle with self-discipline, but it can be one of the problems with self-discipline and discipline with God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service or as people pleasers, but as bond servants to Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Wow, that's pretty impressive. How are you supposed to work? Working as unto the Lord. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or he is free. It was, uh, once again, Cora. Uh, I googled uh, Cora, and what do you think, truly think of your boss? Here we go. Generally, I like him, but sometimes he's really an idiot. I'm self-employed. I just thought I'd lighten the mood. Um, Once again, uh, once again, there's often criticism of Scripture about this issue on slavery. Uh, if you read really carefully in there, you will notice that there is equality. Matter of fact, when we read the second half particularly, there's equality between the slave and the slave owner. And it was definitely destroying the roots. But in this moment of how to live, and we're going to apply it to our work relationships, viewing submission as a service to Christ, this involves our heart. Not just duty, not just I'm going to get in trouble, not I'm going to get paid. But I am here to serve as I am serving unto Christ. That's what I do with my job, with my time. Bond servants of Christ, that we are both bond servants of Christ, therefore we are equally in submission. I, I could be in submission to my employer, my employer could be in submission to God himself. This is the reality. We're both working for productivity. This is part of what God's doing. We're doing it together. Well, we've looked at the one side. Let's look at the other side. Because this is where we don't normally spend as much time. But we want to look at the other side of this story. While there's a life of submission that all of us are involved in, in some place in our life, there's also the leading in love, which probably every one of us are either involved in or we will be involved in in our lives. This is what it's supposed to look like when we lead in love. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 33. And and now we move to the the life of the the husband. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that he... She might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of this body, 
Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife. The two shall become what? One. Not two autonomous beings with one ruling over the other. One flesh. This is a mystery profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. An interesting thing about this passage is that there are 40 verses dedicated to the wife's role in submission. There are 115 dedicated to husbands loving their wives. And I want to tell you this, while submission is challenging, no matter what part of life you find it in, obeying the speed limit, while that is challenging, loving as Christ loves is equally as challenging. It is equally as challenging. And yet it is essential to end the hostility in leading relationships, no matter which one it is. And we're going to see that in all three. This is where greatness is found. This is where greatness hits the rubber on the road. This is where we stop talking about, I love God and I really want to serve Him. And we go, wait a minute. This is what it looks like today with my spouse or my child or my employees. This is what it looks like. Here in this relationship, it's described as a beautifying relationship. By nature, marriage is designed by God to be beautifying, to be building, to be encouraging. That's what it's supposed to be. It's not just supposed to end hostility. It's actually supposed to make it gorgeous. That's the way it should look the longer we're married and if it's a Christ-centered relationship, no matter which one it is, it should become a beautiful thing. It focuses in on the unity of the marriage and not personal satisfaction alone. It is not two separate individuals, but one unified person serving together. The reality is real love, with that in mind of being one, will make submission more palatable. It's still difficult. <laughs> it's still difficult, but it makes it palatable. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Let's go to the next one. Once again, children, obey your parents, but what's the response? Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. In other words, that natural tendency that we have when it's not very good, obedience isn't what it ought to be, Anger is a natural response. It's also the wrong response. Don't provoke. Don't build up a relationship that's built on that, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Once again, leading in love is a beautifying, building, encouraging relationship. That is what it's supposed to look like. Discipline by nature is something that points in the right direction Discipline does not necessitate always punishment. I'm not saying there's not time for punishment, but the word discipline at its root core is disciple, not punishment. It points people the right way. That's what we're supposed to do, parents. We are here to show children God's love. So, in response to the core a person. I just going to let them figure it out on their own. I don't. That is not what I want to do. I want my kids to know God's love. I hope they can see at least in me at times. Maybe they can be forgiving at the times that it's not, but at least see God's love in me most of the time. In this moment, we avoid the pitfall of power that comes from, from anger and control. See, that's not even in this passage either. And that's where we get, pitfall of power and control. It's making leadership beautiful for the kid. It doesn't end there. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, on to the masters. Masters, do the same to them. In other words, he's actually saying here, imply and, and put in the golden rule. As you want to be treated, treat others. Masters, treat your slave. Employer, treat your employee this way, the way you want want to be treated if the roles were switched. 
That's what it's saying. How would you go about that? Knowing that he is both their master and yours in heaven. And that there is no partiality with him. In other words, while the world sees these differences, he's not seeing any difference. You're all under his leadership, under his, the, the Bible uses the term slave. Here again, there is a rejection of the harshness and the idea that two people, an employee and employer, can work together to be productive in society so that people can eat and that people can have houses and people can pay taxes, build roads, and have a beautiful society. That's what God's saying. So I ask you the question, when God's talking about greatness in your relationship, how does He end the hostility in yours? I want to just throw them out. Which one of these today that you look at and you think to yourself, I'm not where I need to be. Maybe it's with your government and you're bought into this. I can just th trash my government officials anytime I want to. We need to speak with reverence, humility, even when we disagree. Our spouses, our relationships and our marriages, our children, our work lives. I want you to think how much of that, that covers your life right there. Almost every decision you make fits into those categories. And why would we do this? Why would we go about saying yes to submission, no matter where it is in your life? God teaches submission because ultimately it's a reverence for Him. Once again, you want to talk about the exceptions and when it's really horrible leadership, we can talk about that on the side. But as an overriding principle of life, there is submission to those that lead. It is designated or designed to bring about order and peace in our marriages, our families, and in our society. If there is no leadership, there will be chaos, and we end up with the strongest, the most powerful, the most vicious end up in control. I've been to places in the world, and you have probably seen them on TV, where traffic goes nowhere merely because people will not follow the basic, simple rules of traffic. A red light means red, not I just fill in the box and I block everybody else because I didn't get to go. And that is just a microcosm of what society looks like when everybody throws off the shackles and says, hey, I'm autonomous. I can do anything I want to. I don't have to submit to anyone. None of us get what we want. None of us get the great life. I would like for you to begin to think your leaders through. The worship team is going to come. The people that lead you are the people that you're leading. Both sides of the argument or both sides of the coin today. Think about those people in your life right now and ask some simple questions. Do I struggle with submission to good leadership? Not perfect leadership, just good leadership. Do I struggle in submitting to it? Flip side of that is, do I lead well with love? Do I tend to be gracious and think of the other person and put myself in their role and how would I do it if, how would I want to be treated if I were them? I want to leave you with one last thought about living up, living great. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1-2, through two, he picks this up. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And while Paul is specifically speaking about government leaders here, we can apply this across the board. I want to ask you, when you went through the list, you went, you know what? I, I struggle to be submissive in this relationship. I want to ask you to begin to pray for that person. I want you to ask, really get concentrated and, God, I want to do that better. Somehow I've become very angry at my employer. Or there's this kind of tension between us, my parents, and myself. And, God, I want that to end. Or maybe it's the flip side of the coin where you're leading people and you're going, you know, I don't do that the way I ought to. Sometimes I'm harsh. And I don't really put myself in their position. Think about them. God, I want to lead the way you want. I want my life to be holy and blameless before you, the way I treat other people. Let's pray. Father, thank you.
for the opportunities that your word provides us to think about the most practical details of how we intersect with one another and interact with one another. God, this is where every day intersects our theology. Where our emotions get in the way. Our history of failure kind of intersects with the moment. And God, we need your help. We want to live up to this that you've called us to, this holy and blameless before you, to live out our relationships comfortable with submission, willing to submit to, to good leadership, but also leading well when we're supposed to lead well, to be that leaders for others. So God, we come with confession on our heart that we need you. We need your forgiveness and your grace.